Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 10. What a powerful book this is. Chapter 10 says this. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. Let me just hit that quickly because this is sort of a theme that uh, we've been talking about here in the last couple of chapters. It says, for the law having a shadow of the good things to come. Now when he says the law, he's talking really generally about the Old Testament, but specifically about the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses. So he says, the law having a shadow of good things to come. Well, what does that mean? That means that all of those laws that we're saying you can't do this and you can't do that and you have to measure up to perfection, really all those laws were showing that there was going to come a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God man. <laughs> he's God, but he's also a human being. And so he's going to come and guess what? He's going to fulfill the law. He's going to be that kind of an innocent, perfect man that actually can and will keep all the standards. And then he'll die in our place as if he didn't. But nonetheless, it's also a shadow of how we can be before the Lord. That uh, in the Old Testament, there was still the weakness of human flesh. But in the New Testament, you can be born again. And so even though your flesh is weak, you have a born again spirit. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then with the power of the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you have the ability to tell your flesh, no, you're not going to live like that. You're going to live for God. You're going to be obedient. You're going to do right before the Lord. Folks, we can do this. What was done in the Old Testament, all those laws that they could not fulfill because they were weak in the New Testament, those were a shadow of this, that now we can do it. So notice again, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same Old Testament sacrifices, which they continue, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Uh, for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin, uh, sins if those uh, sacrifices of the Old Testament would have really cleansed them, then those worshipers would not have had a consciousness of sin. See, the blood of Jesus washes away our guilty conscience as well. And we can actually have joy in his presence and really not only be forgiven, but feel forgiven from the heart, from the core of our beings. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. See, a physical human body. So God didn't offer this, God didn't desire the sacrifices of animals to pay for the sins of men. They couldn't. But Jesus said, a body you prepared for me. You gave me, who has always been God, his spirit in eternity past. He said, you gave me a human body. Why? So that I could die and be the sacrifice. He said, but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. You had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. The Old Testament was really written about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. Of course, prophecies of his coming as well. 
to do your will, O God. He said the Old Testament was written, including those types and shadows, the symbolisms of the old law and the sacrifices, all that was written about the New Testament time. Verse 8, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Talking about the first covenant and establishing now the second covenant. By that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every high priest, excuse me, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, capital M, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. I remember being in Bible college way back in the mid-1980s. And boy, that particular verse really ministered to me. Listen to this. It says in verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Listen to this. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Jesus sat down and he's seated right now at the right hand of Father God, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Well, who's going to make them his footstool? Look at this next verse. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. See, he came and died and he became the sacrifice, the one and only needed sacrifice for sin. Human innocent blood has been spilled to pay for the sins of the world, past, present, and future. Now all we need to do is receive the forgiveness from that sacrifice. See, But notice this. Once he offered himself as the sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and he's been waiting until his enemies are made a footstool. So who's going to do that? Well, verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those. That's us. That's the body of Christ. That, that's believers, the bride of Christ. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, who are being set apart. We're the ones, folks, that are taking the authority in the name of Jesus and putting his enemies under his feet, including sin, the devil, demons, sickness, disease, poverty, destruction, uh, hate, racism, uh, abuse, etc., etc. Every one of the enemies of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're empowered now with the authority in Jesus' name to put those under his feet. And by the way, where are his feet? Are they in his head? No, they're in his body. And we are the body of Christ. So when he says they're going to be put under his feet, that means they're not only put under him, but they're put under us. We are the body of Christ. All right, verse 15. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering of sins. Well, if they've already been forgiven, then we don't need to continually offer sacrifices for sin anymore. That would include penance, like trying to obey enough to get God to forgive you or for you to feel forgiven. No, you have to put faith in the sacrifice of Jesus. He did it once for all. That's it. Put your faith in that. Receive the forgiveness that came from that. Verse 18. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. See, we're supposed to, in prayer, enter right into the holiest of all, the holy of holies, where God is, the throne room of God, not with animal blood, but with the blood of Jesus. So he said, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, 
by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. See, there it is. God doesn't want us merely to be forgiven. He wants us to be full of faith that we're forgiven, full of joy that we're forgiven. So he says, let us draw near, talking about to God, to the presence of God, into the holiest of all, uh, by a new and living way, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Watch this. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That would include a guilty conscience. <laughs> but that also includes a conscience that is, is wanting to do wrong. No, God wants to purify us from that. Oh, I don't want to do wrong. My flesh is stupid and it'll want to do wrong, but I don't want to do wrong. I want to do right before God. I'm the born again person inside. And if you're born again, you have that person inside. Feed that person. Identify with that person, not with the flesh and not with your mind. So he says that we should draw near in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I believe that's a reference to being baptized in water. You get born again. You get washed on the inside by the blood of Jesus. And then by being baptized, you're going through an exercise and you're feeling that washing on the outside that is helping you to understand what happened really on the inside. Water baptism doesn't save anybody. It's the faith inside and the blood of Jesus cleansing them on the inside that really makes them saved. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Boy, if you could just get that one verse right there, it's powerful. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So because the Lord promised, because God's word is truth and he promised these things, let's hold fast the confession of of our hope without wavering. In other words, let's speak as if the promises of God are true and as if God is going to bring them to pass, even if it doesn't look like it, even if it looks impossible. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let me just give you a different way of saying that. Hey, the closer we get to Jesus coming back, the more we need to be meeting together as believers. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, as some people do. Some people go to church less and less these days. But the Bible says, no, the closer you get to the coming of the Lord, you need to go to church. You need to be a part of church, whether that be a church on a campus somewhere, a church in a home. You need to be with believers, having church, doing church more and more, more frequently as the day of the Lord approaches. Why? Because the days are going to be evil because you're going to be tempted to veer off. So he said, by getting together, we can stir one another up to love and good works. Okay, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, this is really interesting that he says, we need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but get together even more as we see the day, capital D, the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Well, if we're not getting together with the body and we're not being strengthened to live right, then in essence, we're choosing to not continue to walk strongly with the Lord. And he said, if you sin willfully, like you know that you should be going after the things of God, but you're allowing yourself to be distracted. He said, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. In other words, what other sacrifice are you going to get that will wash you from these sins if you're not coming to the Lord and allowing him to wash you? See, there's no other place to go. Jesus is the only sacrifice. So that's why we need to lean into him and not allow ourselves to be distracted away from him. 
So verse 27. Uh, well, let me read 26 and 27 together. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. This is what he's saying. He's saying, folks, you are vulnerable to going to hell if you stop get going to church, if you stop meeting with the brothers, if you stop hearing the word of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the enemy is tempting. Sin is tempting. And sin wants to pull you away from the Lord. And this shows, once again, along with many other passages, that just because you were saved doesn't mean you'll always be saved. No, we can veer off. We can be distracted away from the Lord. And he said, and if that happens, if you sin willfully, then uh, you are subject to judgment and fiery indignation. Folks, that's talking about hell. So notice this, verse 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Here you have the sacrifice of all sacrifices paid for you, and yet you don't even walk in the truth of it. You don't even walk in the purity of being forgiven and washed. You, you continue to walk as if you're an unbeliever, compromising and doing things that are not right. So he says, uh, even in the Old Testament, people that compromised on the witness of two or three people would be condemned and even put to death in some situations. He said, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. These are the things that we're doing when we go back into sin and not pursue the things of God with all these blessings that God has given us. Verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Notice, the Lord's not only going to judge the world, the Lord will judge his people. Uh, verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains. And it kind of sounds like Paul, doesn't it? But of course, could be another apostle, somebody else that was in prison. He said, you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, now listen to this. I was looking forward to getting to this verse. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Those two verses are powerful. Therefore, verse 35, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Folks, we have to be careful that we don't get discouraged. Don't cast away your confidence. God's word gives us promises. Jesus made a covenant swearing in his own blood that God would keep his promises. But we have to keep and retain our confidence in the word of God. He said, don't cast away your confidence, which has great reward. If you can be confident about the word of God and walk in it in that confidence, he said, you'll receive great reward for you have need of endurance. In other words, this is not a sprint. This is a long cross country race, so to speak, a marathon. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Oh, a lot of people think, well, is Jesus really ever going to come back and such? Well, that's what people said about the first coming. Is, he, is the Messiah ever going to come? Well, guess what? He did <laughs> and did exactly what the prophecies of Scripture said he would do in that first coming. 
Of course, the Jewish people didn't see the difference between the first and second comings, which is largely why, or at least a good part why, many don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah because he didn't fulfill the other prophecies that we know will be fulfilled in the second coming. For yet a little while, verse 37, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now, here's what we need to do now. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Folks, that's not us. We're not of those who draw back. We're of those who press in and press forward. He goes on to say here in the last verse of chapter 10, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Folks, that's us. We're not the retreaters. No, we're the advancers. We're the ones who believe the promises and we keep moving forward against all odds, against impossible situations, knowing that our God is so powerful He causes the impossible to be possible. Praise God. Well, thank God for Hebrews chapter 10. I pray this is ministering to you. God's word is truth. And these promises are in the Bible so that we can live by them. I've enjoyed being with you today. I look forward to Hebrews chapter 11, another famous chapter tomorrow.